Today we are going to learn the conditional probability. So what is conditional probability? We will see it. Conditional probability is a bit advanced concept compared with the simple probabilities which we discussed in our previous lecture. Uh, this is your chapter number 13, which is labeled as the general rules of probability. Under this chapter, we will discuss the definition of conditional probability. We will derive a simple mathematical form equation to calculate the conditional probabilities. And after that, you will see something called the total probability rule. And then, finally, we will discuss the base theorem. We will also look at the examples. Now, the conditional probability is a bit advanced concept, and even at grad school levels, some students struggle to understand when it comes to Bayes' theorem and total probability rule. And there are not that many internet resources also available explaining those uh, concepts, conditional probability, the total probability rule, and Bayes' theorem with sufficient clarity. Please listen to this lecture carefully. You're going to understand everything you need about the conditional probability, the total probability rule, and the Bayes theorem. As always, I have posted this lecture note on Canvas. Please go ahead and download that, and then you can fill these blanks while watching the video. All right, uh, and under point number one, I need to once again visit the concept of simple probabilities versus the conditional probabilities. Well, of course, conditional probabilities is the new concept which we are going to learn today. Uh, but even in the previous lectures, we talked about simple probabilities. Well, of course, I didn't specifically mention the term simple. And of course, it is not a technical term used widely in statistical contexts. Uh, but we have to see there are two basic types of probabilities. So I need a word for the previously discussed type, which is probabilities of just one event. Today, we are going to see probabilities of two events in combination. So let's define the simple and conditional probabilities this way. This is under point number one. I would say simple probabilities This means the probabilities of a single event. Probability of a single event. We discussed so many things about the probabilities of single events. So what's an example for the probability of a single event? Well, think about the probability of rain. Probability of rain, maybe within the next hour. Well, this is just one event, and the probability of rain is what I named. So it can be seen as a direct, simple probability. Now, that probability alone may not be very accurate for somebody who is all 24 hours inside a building and who doesn't have access to at least a weather app. How can you estimate this probability without any other information? Well, that's a bit of a challenge. But on the other hand, if I have some information, such as the availability of dark clouds outside, then I can come up with a better estimate for this probability. Right? Now, that's where we use conditional probability. We can use the knowledge of a related other event to improve the probability of the event of interest. So I will write down the definition for conditional probability this way. Introduction, of course, not the perfect definition yet. We'll see the definition in the next point. But here I'm going to write down an introduction to conditional probability. Conditional probability is an improved probability of an event given the prior information or in other words, given the probability of a different event. Okay. So I would say conditional probability is an improved probability given the probability of another event. Would say another related event. 
This means there are two events. For example, think about the probability of not just rain, but given that there are dark clouds outside. Now, if I have information about this, now what's the probability of dark clouds within the next hour? If that probability is, let's say, 90%, then the probability of rain, given that information, could be more reliable. Maybe it's 80%. Now, if the probability of dark clouds is, let's say, 10%, in that case, probability of rain, given that information about dark clouds, should also be low, such as maybe 5%, right? So that's where the conditional probability plays the role. Now this given that term, uh, we would like to replace it with a mathematical symbol. It's not a complicated symbol. In conditional probability statements, these two events are separated with a vertical line, like that. And you read it as probability of the first event given that the second event has already occurred. Okay? Yeah, that's it. That's all about the conditional probability. That's the introduction to conditional probability. All what we need is a way to calculate these kinds of probabilities. For that, we are going to derive a simple mathematical equation. We will look at a simple mathematical model. And we'll try to derive an equation which provides us this probability. Okay? Let's move on to point number two. We will look at a simple mathematical model for the conditional probability. Point number two, a mathematical model for conditional probability. This is a very simple example and you're going to understand conditional probability completely with this example. Think about a box. I'm going to have a box with marbles. Marbles from two different colors. Okay. We have a box with, um, let's say, a uh, box with marbles. Uh, it has how many blue? Let's say I have five blue marbles, and um, let's say I have three red marbles. Altogether, I have eight marbles in the box. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do two things in two steps, okay? First step, Take one marble out and uh, observe the color. We will not replace that. So I take one and keep it outside. Okay? And I'm going to take another one. That is my second step. Okay? So I will complete right on the first step. Take one out. Do not replace it. Keep it outside. Now here's the second step. In the second step, I will take another one. And observe color. Okay? That's all I'm going to do. Let's see if we can figure out the probabilities for these two steps. Let's say I'm interested in receiving two blue marbles in both steps. Okay. Made to find probability of receiving blue in step one and blue in step two. 
for both steps, I need blue. Okay. Let's see how to figure out that probability. Now, here's our box. And this box has five blue. So here are those five blue marbles. And I have three red. Now here are those three red marbles. And for step one, all the probabilities are very straightforward. Okay. Um, I will let B1 be the event that I get a blue marble in my first trial. Okay. So the probability of B1, I would say B1, is receiving blue in trial one. And I will also write down what happens in B2 in the second step. I will let that event be B2, receiving blue in trial 2. Of course, I can write down PB1 without any hassle. So what is PB1? Probability of receiving a blue marble in the first step. What is it? Well, altogether I have 8. 5 blue plus 3 red, I get 8 total. Out of 8, I have five blue marbles. So the numerator should be five. So the probability of receiving a blue in trial one should be equal to five eights. Now this should be very straightforward. Now the challenge is, can I write down probability of B2? Well, even though I wrote down only PB1, I don't know exactly what color was the first step, whether it was actually a blue or whether it was actually a red. Well, if I want to write down the probability of red receiving in step one, that will be equal to three over eight. Okay, that's a non-zero probability. So I don't know what actually happened in the first step. So without knowing, what really happened in the first step, I practically cannot write down this probability for step number two. Now this is where the conditional probability is required. I can write down PB2 if I know what happened in the first step. Let's say in the first step we had a red marble. So I will write it as this, P, B2, given what happened in the first step, let's say it was a red marble. Now this probability can be written. What is this probability? Well, in the first step, I took a red marble out. So I now have only two red marbles, because I'm not going to replace it. It's completely outside. So the total I have is seven. Out of seven, I have five blue marbles. Only one red marble was gone. Okay, So five red marbles are still there. So this is that probability if the first step was a red marble. Now the same way I can write down the probability of blue in the second step given that the first step was also blue. Now what is this probability? Well, we had altogether eight marbles and one was taken out. That means our denominator is seven. That's very straightforward. Now this statement says, in the first step, I took a blue marble out. So a blue marble is gone. Initially we had five blue. Now one is gone, I have four blue left. So the probability of receiving a blue in the second step should be 4 out of 7. 4 out of 7. Alright, now we have these probabilities. But what I need is a slightly different probability. What I need is 
to find the probability of receiving blue in step one and blue in step two, right? Basically, what I did is probability of blue in step one and blue in step two. Probability B1 and B2, that's what I need. Or in mathematical symbols, what I need is P, B1, intersection B2. Now, how can I find that? Well, can you remember the equation for two independent events? We discussed that during our previous lecture regarding the simple probabilities. We said if two events, A and B, are independent, there's one specific mathematical equation for that. What is that equation? Well, here's that equation. Recall, if A and B are independent, we said the probability of intersection of the two events should be equal to the product of the two simple probabilities of events A and B. Okay, so we said if A and B are independent, probability of A and B, which is A intersection B, should be equal to probability of A times probability of B. But this is only if A and B are independent. What's the meaning of being independent? We said two events are independent if the probability of one event does not affect the probability of the other event. Let's come back to this example. Whatever happened in step one affects the probabilities of step two, correct? So, these two steps are not independent. Now, is there a way that I can convert them as independent? Well, if I know what really happened in the previous step, then I can model this as two independent events. Because, if I know what happened in the first step, think about another completely new box consisting of number of marbles without one marble which happened in the first step. Now in that case, I have two separate boxes. Taking one marble from one box and taking another marble from the other box are two different events they are independent. If we see it that way, we can say that those two events are independent. Well, probability B1 and B2 will not be independent. Therefore, I cannot write them as probability B1 times probability B2. But B1 and B2 given B1 are independent. Therefore, this can be written as, instead of probability of B1 times probability of B2, this can be written as probability of B1 times probability of B2 given B1. Right? Well, we technically have the equation we need for conditional probability. This is that equation. Simple. We can rearrange the terms in that equation and subject the conditional probability. And that will be the final equation we need to find the conditional probabilities. So how do you subject this term from this equation? I can divide both sides by PB1. Okay, I can divide both sides of this equation by PB1 so that I can isolate this term on one side of the equation. So if I do that, I get probability B2 given B1 equals probability of B1 intersection B2 divided by probability of B1. So here's the equation that you need for the conditional probability. These probabilities are familiar probabilities from our previous lecture. The numerator probability 
you may remember this as probability of B1 and B2. The denominator is B1. Now, what's the connection between these, this denominator and that conditional probability? Whatever happened in the previous step, or in other words, this term will go to the denominator of the right hand side. Whatever happened in the first step will go to the denominator on the right hand side. The numerator is very straightforward. You just have to take the intersection between these two events. Right? Now that's the equation for conditional probability. We write out the equation using A and B as well. Okay, just rather than writing it with B1, B2, the subscripts and the same symbol might be slightly confusing to some students. So we write down the same equation again using A and B as well. So here's the equation for the conditional probability. I will let A and B be two events. There's one more part of this statement for the complete definition. Uh, I will add it in a minute. Now I need to write down the equation for, let's say, probability of A given B. Now in this case, B has happened already. So what's the numerator? Numerator is the intersection between these two. You can write it as probability A intersection B. Or you may write it as probability A and B. Now what should be written in the bottom? Is it PA or is it PB? Look at this term. It is a B on the right hand side of this conditional probability. That should go to the bottom. That should go to the bottom. You write PB in the bottom. All right, uh, now here's the next condition required. A and B are two events. But look at this equation. You are dividing by the probability of B. So I would say, let A and B be two events so that probability of B is not equal to zero. Because in mathematics, you cannot define the division by zero. Okay? All right, that's it. So that's the equation of conditional probability. You have to remember this equation always. The numerator, if you like, can be remembered as probability of A and B as well. And that divided by BB. All right, let's move on to the third point, independent events. Now, in our previous lecture regarding the simple probabilities, we said if the two events A and B are independent, the probability of A intersection B should be equal to probability of A times probability of B. But we didn't show how do we obtain that equation. But here, right now, we can explain the reasons. Now here are the reasons. If A and B are independent, now what can you say about the conditional probability of one of those two events given the other event? Now, if they are independent, probability of A given B should be equal to probability of the event A. You cannot improve the probability of event A just because you know the probability of event B because A and B are independent. Okay? Therefore, this conditional probability should be straight away equal to B A. Or you can write the other way around as well, which means probability of B given A. Knowing what happened in the previous step as the event A will not help us improve the probability of B. So probability of B given A should be equal to probability of B. Well, we can use either of these two equations and establish the previous equation that we saw in the simple probabilities discussion. Now we can write down the definition of A given B. So what's the definition of A given B? The definition is probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B. 
then the bottom should go to the denominator. So when A and B are independent, this will be equal to PA. Now if I multiply both sides by PB, I get that equation, probability of A intersection B equals probability of A times probability of B. So this equation holds true for two independent events A and B because the conditional probability will not give you any better estimate than the simple probability if the two events are independent. You can obtain the same equation using this guy as well. You can try it yourself. Okay? Alright, let's move on to point number four. Equation of conditional probability. We we'll write down that equation just one more time. You can do it. Okay? Write down the equation for conditional probability for two events A and B. So here's the equation for conditional probability. Probability of A given B is equal to probability of A and B, or in other words, A intersection B, divided by this guy go to the denominator, PB, probability of B. And probability of B should not be equal to zero. That's that equation. And you can write down the conditional probability equations using any other symbols as well. Okay? Probability C given B. How do you write this? The numerator is very straightforward. You can write it as probability C intersection D. In the bottom, D should be written. Probability of D. Okay. That's it. And then we say probability of D should be different from zero. Okay. All right. Uh, then here's an example. Please read question number five and see if you can answer. So the problem five says, a past intro statistics class had 40 students enrolled, 32 of them turned in all the assignments. 30 of them turned in all the assignments and scored 90 or above total marks of the semester. Find the probability that a student scoring 90 or above total marks, given that student turned in all the assignments. So we have to figure out what are the two events, A and B. So I will let a be the event that the student turned in all the assignments. I will let B be the event that the student scores above 90%. Now, the probabilities are given to us. We had 40 students enrolled, 32 of them turned in all the assignments. That means PA is equal to 32 out of 40. Right? And 30 of them turned in all the assignments and scored 90 or above total marks of the semester. That means probability of A and B is equal to 30 out of 40. Now this means the probability of A intersection B. That's equal to 30 out of 40. So you can use either way of writing. So whichever is convenient for you, you can use that notations. And what we have to find is, find the probability that a student scoring 90 or above probability of B, given that student turned in all the assignments. Probability of B given A. That's what I need. I need probability of B given A. Read the questions carefully and identify the events and write down the probabilities accordingly. So P, B given A, the numerator should be probability of B intersection A, just the intersection between the two. In the bottom, what I should write the letter in the right hand side here. That should go to the bottom. Okay? So PA, that's what I have right. And I of course have these values. B intersection A is also equal to A intersection B. That probability is equal to 30 over 40 
or that divided by P A, which is the 2 over 4. Now, do you know how to simplify that? There are four levels, and uh, you can multiply by the common denominator, which is 40. You can multiply both top and bottom by 40. And then you get the answer, 30 divided by 32, which can be simplified and written as 15 over 16. And I accept the decimals as well. So if you don't like to do the fraction simplification, completely fine. Just simply use your calculator and obtain the answer up to fourth decimal. Okay, good. That's how you can answer that question. Let's move on. And there's a similar question given under point number six. A maintenance firm has estimated the following probabilities with past data on failure mechanisms of air conditioning systems. Probability of gas leaks equals 0.8131. Probability of gas leak and electrical failure equals 0 0.5140. Find the probability of electrical failure given that there was a gas leak. Very straightforward. So if necessary, we can define the two events A and B real quick. I will let A be the event that there is a gas leak. And I will let B be the event that there is an electrical failure. So uh, given probabilities are the probability of gas leak is given, P A is given as 0.8131. Probability of gas leak and electrical failure, which means A and B, or in other words, A intersection B, that probability is given. It is equal to 0 0.5140. And what we need to find is, find the probability of electrical failure, which is the event B, given there was a gas leak, given the event A. Very straightforward. You can write down the equation, plug in the values, and you're done. So this is probability, once again, B intersection A, all divided by this guy for the bottom, P A. So these two are given 0 0.5140, that divided by 0 0.8131, you can find the answer. Now remember one thing, conditional probability is also a probability. And on the right hand side, you are dividing two probabilities. As the answer, if you ever get something larger than 1, you have done it incorrectly. Okay? Even though this is a conditional probability, it is still a probability. That means this guy should also exist only between 0 and 1. Keep that in mind. All right, let's move on to the next question, problem 7. Assume that the current measurements in a strip of wire follow a normal distribution with a mean of 10 milliamperes and a variance of 4 milliamperes squared. What's the probability that a randomly selected strip of wire has a current measurement of greater than 7.5 milliamperes given that its current measurement is lesser than 11.5 milliamperes? All right, that's a slightly different question. So uh, it's a probability question with probability distributions. And we've seen probability calculations with distributions in the past. So it's not a big deal for us. Now, before defining the two events, the current measurement greater than 7.5 milliamperes is one event. Current measurement is lesser than 11.5 milliamperes is the other event. Before defining those events, I have to first define the random variable. And we will also write down the distribution using the standard notations. So I will let x be our random variable, which is the current measurement. So it's given that x follows a normal distribution with a mean of 10 milliamperes and a variance of 4 milliamperes squared. So variance of 4 means what should be the standard deviation? Standard deviation is square root of 4 which is 2. And you write 
This has standard deviation squared, sigma squared. Okay. So your mu equals 10, sigma equals 2. Those values are important when you enter them into your calculator. All right, uh, and then we have to define the two events. I'm going to let A be the event that the current measurement is greater than 7.5. That means x is greater than 7.5. And I will let B be the event that the current measurement is lesser than 11.5. Now what we need is the probability that a randomly observed strip of wire has a current measurement greater than 7.5, which is probability of A, given that its current measurement is lesser than 11.5, given that it's lesser than 11.5, given B. So basically, I need to figure out that probability and I can write down the equation again. The numerator is very straightforward. It should be A intersection B, probability of A intersection B, divided by probability of B. Okay. So how do we find these probabilities? Now, probability of B is very simple. B is defined as lesser than 1.5. So we can straight away find it. So here is our normal distribution. centered at 10, so mu equals 10. So let's first find the probability of B. Event B is defined as lesser than 11.5. So 11.5 will be somewhere here. Lesser than that. That means area to the left. We can find the probability of B using this graph, we have to go to distributions, select normal CDF. The law limit is negative infinity. You can enter something negatively large, like negative 100,000. This one is an upper limit, 11.5. Your mu equals 10, sigma equals 2, and in case, you should get this answer. So here's your tier 84 calculator. Let's see how to find that probability. I have to go to distributions, I can do that by clicking second and variables. That's where we have distributions. And now I need to select number two, normal CDF. Select that, hit enter. The lower limit is negative infinity. So the default value shown here is good. And in case if your calculator doesn't show that, you can enter a negative large number. Here's a negative symbol you should use. You don't use the subtraction symbol. So use the negative symbol, which is the key left of the enter key and uh, enter something large, like negative 100 million. The upper limit is 11.5, and the mu is 10, and the sigma value is equal to 2. And that's all. You have to select paste and hit enter, and hit enter again. You get 0.7734, approximately, to the fourth decimal place. I got 0 0.7734. Now, the same way, we can find the probability of A intersection B. So what is A intersection B? A and B. So A says more than 7.5. B says lesser than 11.5. So A and B, both conditions are met. That means I need the probability where the current is between 7.5 and 11.5. So we can find that probability also using the same probability distribution centered at 10. The lower limit this time is 7.5, upper limit is 11.5. So what I need is the area between those two specific points. You have to go to distributions, select normal CDF. The lower limit is 7.5, upper limit is 11.5, mu equals 10, sigma equals 2, paste, you get the answer. So you get probability of a intersection B is equal to... Here's the calculator again. Let's go to distributions, second variables. That's where we have distributions. And then select number two, normal CDF, hit enter. The lower limit this time is 7.5. The upper limit is 11.5.
mu is equal to 10 and sigma is equal to 2. Select paste, hit enter and hit enter again. The answer is 0 0.6677. I got 0 0.6677. So you just have to plug in those two values and divide and you get the answer. 0.6677 divided by 0.7734 and you can get the final answer. Always go for four decimal places um, just to be on safe side. Alright, so those are the examples from conditional probability definition. I hope you are comfortable with the equation of the conditional probability. Now we can slowly move on to the next stage, uh, which discusses a little bit of advanced theorems with conditional probability. Let's move on to point number eight, total probability rule. probability rule is a very interesting concept. Um, let's see it this way. I will let S be a sample space. You know what is the sample space, right? All possible outcomes of a random variable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition the sample space into few subsets. The term partition is very important just like your hard disk partition. You can partition your hard disk so that all the partitions together will form the sample space. And between any two partitions, there is no any common space shared. That means there is no intersection between any two partitions. That holds exactly as that for the partition of the sample space as well. Um, for the simplicity, I will let just B1, B2, and B3, just three pieces, be a partition of the sample space S. So using a Venn diagram, I can show it. Let's say this is my sample space. And I'm going to partition this into three pieces. So this is my B1, this is my B2, this is my B3. So the term partition is very important. The meaning of that term is there are two pieces for the meaning. The first piece is if you take the unions of all of these pieces, we get the sample space. That means B1 union, B2 union, B3, we get sample space. Of course, 3 is a specific number, just randomly I picked to partition that into 3, but you can always partition that into more than 3 pieces. Okay? Um, the union should be equal to the sample space. That's the first condition. The second condition is there's no intersection between any two of them. No intersection between any two. Any two out of B1, B2, and B3. Okay? Good. Now I'm going to let A be another event in this same sample space. Let A another event in the same sample space S. I will show the event A uh, just like this. This is my event A. Now, is there a way that you can write down this part of the set A using the elements of the partition and the set A itself. 
Of course, we can do that. This is B1, B1 intersection A, isn't it? The complete large set here is B1, and this part is from A. So the shaded part in red can be labeled as B1 intersection A. And similarly, look at this part in the middle. How can you label that? That can be labeled as B2 intersection A. Similarly, if I shade this piece, which is now in B3, I can label that part as B3 intersection A. Correct? Now, if you look at those three pieces, that itself will be a partition of the set A because there is no intersection between any two of these and all of these pieces together, if you take the union, they will form A. So I will write down an equation for that. So A is equal to B1 intersection A union B2 intersection A union B3 intersection A. Correct? Now I'm going to use a property from probability. One of the basic axioms. We had three basic axioms. What are those basic axioms? We said the probability of the null set should be equal to zero, probability of the sample space should be equal to one. That's our first basic axiom. And then we said probability of any event should be between zero and one. That was the second basic axiom. And then there was a third basic axiom, which is very important. We discussed that one before moving into the principle of inclusion and exclusion, which says if two events, A and B, are mutually exclusive, which means there's no intersection between A and B. In that case, you can write the probability of A union B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B. We cannot write it as that if there is an intersection between A and B. Okay? Now, if you look at these pieces, between any two of them, there is no intersection. Therefore, these unions can be converted into summations in the probability statement. So I'm going to write down the probability of this event A as this probability of A should be equal to probability of the first part, which is B1 intersection A, plus probability of the second part, which is probability of B2 intersection A, plus the probability of the third part, which is probability B3 intersection A. All right, now this is where I'm going to use the definition of conditional probability. So the definition of conditional probability says probability of A given B should be equal to what? Probability of A intersection B all divided by probability of B. Now that means if I multiply both sides of this equation by probability of B, I get probability of a given B times probability of B is equal to probability of A intersection B. Now that equation written with B1, B2, B3 respectively will be substituted for each of these three terms. That means I can write down the probability of A is equal to 
this part will be written as probability of a given b1 times probability of b1 because this part is b1 intersection a or in other words a intersection b1 okay so i'm going to write that first part as probability a given b1 times probability of b1 now similarly the second part can be written as probability of a given b2 times probability of b2 now similarly the third part can be written as probability of a given b3 times probability of b3 now this is simply the total probability rule now we can extend that into more than three partitions as well in general we can say this can be extended up to n number of partitions so i will write down the total probability rule in a more general sense okay instead of just b1 b2 b3 as three partitions i will generalize that up to n number of partitions so i don't need this part i will just need this final equation so i'm going to erase these things so instead of just b1 b2 and b3 i would say b1 b2 b3 up to in general b sub n so s is a sample space i don't want that part as well all right so here we have to try down the complete total probability rule i'm going to let s be a sample space let b1 b2 b3 up to b sub n be a partition of s which means all of these sets together which means if you take the union of b1 b2 b3 up to bn should form s and there is no any intersection between any of these sets okay and i'm going to let a be any other set any other event event or set they both have the same meanings so let a be any other event in the sample space s then the total probability rule says this and we are going to generalize it up to n parts then p a will be equal to p a given b1 times p b1 plus p a given b2 times p b2 plus p a given b3 times p b3 and so on i will write it up to the nth term so the nth term will be p a given b n times p b sub n um sometimes you can have just two partitions or sometimes you will see three partitions uh in the worst case you might go up to five partitions and usually not more than that okay um now this equation can also be written in a bit more advanced form instead of writing down every single term and plus sign everywhere we can use the sigma notation which we discussed on the first day of our class so the same statement can be written this way p a instead of all these things i will write a sigma notation i will write these things as probability a given b1 b2 b3 b4 and so on so in general i will write it as b sub i times p b i and you can write this as i goes from 1 to n so either form is fine uh, you can select whichever is comfortable for you when you remember the total probability rule okay it's very straight forward you have to identify the conditional probabilities and respective simple probabilities multiply each other and take the summation that's it so carefully read the word problem given and identify your conditional probabilities and the simple probabilities respectively okay good let's move on to the next point and there's an example
uh, we'll go ahead and try that example. A small campus has three departments, aviation, mechanical engineering, and business administration. 60% of the students do aviation, 30% of the students do mechanical engineering, and the remaining 10% of the students do business administration. So it's a partition of three departments. Sample space is all the university students. And then the timely graduation rate expected for aviation is 80%, for mechanical engineering is 70%, and for business administration is 90%. Find the overall timely graduation rate for the campus. Let's first convert these given probabilities into equations. So there are three departments, so I'm going to let B1, B2, and B3 be those three departments. So I will define B1 as aviation, and B2 as mechanical engineering, and B3 as business administration. And also we need the timely graduation rate. So I will define that as another event. I will define A as the timely graduation rate. Now some of the probabilities are given. Well, of course, all the probabilities that we need are given. So let's convert them into these notations. We know the probability of aviation. How many students do aviation. DB1 is given as 60%, which is 0.6. Or you can write it as 0.60 if you like. And then 30% of the students do mechanical engineering. So PB2 is equal to 0.3 or 0.30. And 10% of the students do business administration. So PB3 is 0.10. And then, time of graduation, that information is also given for each of the three departments. They say 80% of aviation students graduate on time. That means probability, graduation on time, given the student is from aviation. That has a chance of 80%. Time of graduation, given the students are from Mechanical engineering, A given B2, that probability is equal to 70%. And probability, timely graduation A given B3, business administration, that probability is given as 90%. What we need to find is the overall timely graduation rate. I need to find PA. So according to the total probability rule, we know that PA will be equal to probability of A given B1 times probability of B1 plus probability of A given B2 times probability of B2 plus probability of A given B3 times probability of B3. So we may write it down as that, A given B1 times BB1 plus probability A given B2 times PB2 plus probability of A given B3 times B, B3. So we can plug in those values and simplify. A given B1 is equal to 0 0.8, 0 0.80, and PB1 is equal to 0 0.60. It's safe to write down these quantities to be multiplied inside parentheses, because we're going to enter them into your calculator and Sometimes students make mistakes with uh, the multiplication and addition. So you can avoid those by using those nice parentheses. Very clear, then uh, A given B2 is 0 0.70, that times PB2 is 0 0.30, plus A given B3 is 0 0.90, times PB3 is 0 0.10. Now you can find that probability and get the answer. All right, so the next question under point number 10 is a similar question. 
simpler than this one because the next question only has two partitions. A small city has 51% of males and 49% of females. The unemployment rate among the males in the city is 4.9% and that among the females in the city is 5.5%. What's the overall unemployment rate of the city? So we can define B1 as the male population, B2 as the female population, and we can define A as the unemployment rate. Okay? So PB1 is 0.51, PB2 is 0.49, and PA given B1 is 0.049, and P A given B2 is 0 0.055. Okay, you can use that information and find probability of A using the total probability rule. So P A will be equal to P A given B1 times P B1 plus P A given B2 times P B2, and that's all you have for that question. Okay, all right, that's it about the total probability rule. Next, we can move on to the Bayes theorem. All right, point number 11, Bayes' theorem. Now, in conditional probability questions, always the basic probabilities will be given to you. The basic probabilities means the probabilities that are required to calculate the total probability. Um, that means always you'll be given um, probability of A given B1, probability of A given B2, probability of A given B3. Likewise, if you have n number of uh, pieces in the partition, all these probabilities will be given up to probability A given Bn. In addition to all of those probabilities, you will also be given the probabilities of each of the pieces in the partition, such as PB1, PB2, PB3, up to PBN. Now, all of these will be given. And you can quite easily find PA in that case. Okay, total probability. So, we already know how to find that. Now, there's one other probability. Uh, sometimes important. The other important probability is is there a way I can flip these two? Say for example, I need probability of B1 given A. Can I find that? Probability of B2 given A. Probability of B3 given A and so on. Well, there's an equation to figure out those probabilities. That equation is given by the Bayes theorem. For the completion of the knot under Bayes theorem, I will once again define S as the sample space and B1, B2, B3 as the partition and so on. Okay? So here's the first part. I will let S be a sample space of some random variable x. And I'm going to let B1, B2, B3, let's say up to B sub n, be a partition of S, partition of the center space. And then I will let A be some other set or an event in the same sample space S. Okay, let A be another event in S. So the Bayes theorem will help you to flip these probabilities. Actually, it's important if you can write down this part also as uh, usually given. Without this information and the total probability concept, the Bayes theorem doesn't make sense. All right, so once these are given, 
I need to flip um, some of these probabilities. Now, in general, you know, if there's a B1 and B2, and there's a subscript with B associated, so uh, I will simply write a B sub J, okay? Um, so the probability of B sub J given A, that's how I can flip this, okay? For example, B1 given A, for example, B2 given A, and so on. Now this guy will be equal to, well, shall we derive the equation real quick? Now, derivation part is outside of the theorem. Um, now, now, here's the derivation. <coughs> I need probability of B sub J given A. If I write down the definition of the conditional probability, uh, numerator of this one will be probability B sub J intersection A, right? Divided by probability of A. Now, that's very straightforward. Now, think about, now, I don't have this probability, bj given a, but what I have is a given bj. So, if you look at the probability a given bj, and if I write down the equation for that, the numerator will be probability a intersection b sub j, all that divided by probability b sub j. Now, if I multiply both sides by B sub J, probability of B sub J, on the left-hand side, I will have probability A given B sub J times probability of B sub J. That should be equal to this probability, A intersection B sub J, because P, B, J will be cancelled with P, B, J when you multiply both sides by that quantity. So I'm going to plug in this left-hand side for the numerator here. A intersection BJ is also equal to BJ intersection A. So I can write down that term on top of this equation. Probability A given BJ times probability of BJ, all that divided by probability of A. Now probability of A is something that we know from the total probability theorem. Okay, so everything is now clear. We know all the pieces on the right hand side. So that's the base theorem. So I will write down here. The numerator is, you flip these two, A given B J times product of B J. Okay. So the numerator, I wrote probability of A given B J, just by flipping that, times probability of B J, all that divided by probability of A. Now that's it. That's the base theorem. There's nothing to struggle. Even though there are many students who struggle with the base theorem, this is it. Okay? Let's do an example. A new analytical method to detect pollutants in water is being tested. This new method of chemical analysis is important because, if adopted, it could be used to detect three different contaminants. Organic pollutants, volatile solvents, and chlorinated compounds. Instead of having to use a single test for each pollutant. The makers of the test claim that it can detect high levels of organic pollutants with 99.7% accuracy, volatile solvents with 99.95% accuracy, and chlorinated compounds with 89.7% accuracy. If a pollutant is not present, the test does not signal. Samples are prepared for the calibration of the test and 60% of them are contaminated with organic pollutants, 27% with volatile solvents, and 13% with traces of chlorinated compounds. A test sample is selected randomly. What's the probability that the test will signal? And then next part is what's the probability that the chlorinated compounds are present given that the test signaled? 
So you will have to use the total probability rule as well as the Bayes theorem to answer that question. So first we will try to convert the given probabilities into the symbols and then we can use those theorems and obtain the answers. So there are three different types of contaminants and I'm going to let B1 be the organic pollutants B2 be the volatile solvents and B3 be chlorinated compounds. I will also need to define a set A. Event A, I will let event A be the event that the test signals. Now the probabilities are given. The test makers claim that it can detect high levels of organic pollutants with 99.7%. That means it signals probability of A given organic pollutants B1 equals 99.7% percent accuracy, which means 0.997. And volatile solvents with 99.95 percent accuracy. That means probability that the test signals given the compound is a volatile solvent, which is B2. That's equal to 0.9995. And the chlorinated compounds with 89.7% accuracy, which means probability A, which is this signals given B3, that's equal to 0.897. And they have prepared the samples. 60% of them are contaminated with organic pollutants, which means we have B, B1 as 60%. and 27% with volatile solvents, which means P, B2 equals 0.27, and P, B3, 13% with chlorinated compounds, which is 0.13. Now we can see that B1, B2, and B3 form a partition. How do we see it? If you add these probabilities, they are added to 100%. So that explains that they form a partition. Of course, in the first part, what we have to do is, um, I need to find the probability that the test will signal. Simply, I just have to find the probability of A. Now, in order to find that probability, I don't even have to write down this breakdown using these symbols, because I just have to identify the conditional probabilities and their corresponding simple probabilities. I just have to multiply them and take the summation. But for the next part, having this written in that form will be required. Because in the next part, we have to use the base theorem. So unless you have written it down this way, I have to flip one of these properties in the next uh, part of the calculation. That part may not be clear. Okay? So please make sure to write it down like that whenever you have to use the base theorem. Okay? But for now, what we need is the total probability rule. So the total probability rule says I just have to multiply these corresponding probabilities. So A given B1, which is 0.997, times PB1, which is 0.6. That plus PA given B2, which is 0.9995, times PB2, which is 0.27. That plus A given B3, which is 0.897, that times PB3, which is 0.9995. One, three. And we need this summation. So that gives us PA. I got 0.9847. Always go up to at least four decimals just to be on the safe side. All right, cool. So we got that. And if you go ahead and read the next part of the question, what's the probability that? The chlorinated compounds are present given that the test signaled. That means I need 
the probability that the chlorinated compounds are present, which means B3, given that the test signaled. Now, this probability is not given straight away. Okay? So, I have to use the Bayes theorem and flip that and obtain our answer. So, the Bayes theorem says, the right hand side, I'm going to flip it again and write P A given B3 times P B3. And the denominator is P A. Okay? Um, now, B3 is that B J of the previous equation that we wrote for the base theorem. All right, now I just have to plug in these values. Probability A given B3 is equal to 0.897 times probability of B3 is equal to 0.13. All that divided by probability of A, which is 0.9847. Okay, so you can simplify that and find the answer. I got 0.1184. All right, so that's one example from the Bayes theorem and also the total probability rule. Is it difficult? No, it is not difficult. It's very straightforward. Okay, cool. All right, uh, let's move on to the next question. There's a table given. So I will draw the table on the whiteboard so that you can easily see it. Point number 13, Tim invests in crypto. The table below shows his returns during a week in fall 2021. Find the total rate of return what cryptocurrency has contributed for the largest proportion of return. Now here's a table, crypto type, portfolio composition, and return. So he has invested in five types of crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, ADA, and other coins of course, uh, more than five types, but uh, the fifth category is just other coins. And portfolio compositions are given that 25% for Bitcoin, 35% for Ethereum, 20% for Litecoin, 12% for ADA, and all other types just 8%. And the returns within that given week are like this. Bitcoin has got 10%. Ethereum 8%, Litecoin 12%, and our 1%, all other coins 9%. Now, as the first part of the question, we need to find the total rate of return for this investor. We can see that uh, this is a partition of his portfolio. If you add all these pieces, they are added to 100%. Okay? So this is all he has as crypto. So I'm going to label um, B1 as Bitcoin, um, B2 as Ethereum, B3 as Litecoin, B4 as ADA, and B5 has all the other coins. I will also need to define an event A. I will let A be the event um, return. Okay, return. You can see that these probabilities are PB1 and PB2, PB3. PB4 and PB5, portfolio compositions. 
And these are the returns. This can be written using the symbols as P A given B1. Return given it is Bitcoin. 8% okay. is the return given it is Ethereum, which is B2. Likewise, we can write the third one as P A given B3. The fourth one as P A given B4. The fifth one as P A given B5. Okay. Now, what I need to do is, I need to find P A, total rate of return. That's the first part of the question. So finding the total rate of return is a question from the total probability rule. So let's find that first. P A, that's very straightforward. That should be equal to P A given B1 times P B1 plus P A given B2 times P B2 plus P A given B3 times P B3 and so on up to the fifth one, right? So A given B1 is 0.1, that times P B1 is 0.1. To five. So likewise, we have to write down every single term up to the last one, which is A given B5 is 0 0.09, that times PB5, which is 0 0.08. Okay? So if we do this calculation, simplify everything, um, you will get 0 0.0854. So the total rate of return is 0 0.08. Or if you need to convert that into percentage, you can write it as 8.54%. Okay? And then I have to go for the next part. So the next part says what cryptocurrency has contributed for the largest proportion of return? Well, just by looking at this table, we cannot say. Well, of course, we have 12% from Litecoin, but this portfolio composition is just. 20%. On the other hand, uh, his largest portfolio composition is for Ethereum, which is for 35%, uh, but the return is fairly small, just 8%. So which cryptocurrency must have contributed for the largest proportion of return uh, for him during that week? Well, to figure that out, you will have to find um, the return for each cryptocurrency type. So given his total return, what's the proportion from Bitcoin? You will need to find PB1 given A. Likewise, you will have to find PB2 given A. Given the return, what's the proportion that contributed from each area? Okay. Likewise, we will have to find PB3 given A, which is proportion from Litecoin given his total return. So we have to find each of these five probabilities, including P, B4 given A, and P, B5 given A. And then we can pick the cryptocurrency type, B1, B2, B3, B4, or B5. So I'm not going to calculate all of these, but I will calculate just uh, one of them. Let's say B1 given A. How do you calculate that? Probability B1 given A. Now that's where I need the base theorem. So the base theorem says this probability should be equal to probability A given B1 times probability of B1 all divided by probability A. Now these two probabilities are given to us. A given B1 is 10% which is 0.1 that times PB1. PB1 is 0.25. And PA, which we calculated in the previous step. So PA is equal to 0 0.0854. So we can simplify that, and if you do so, we get 0.2927. So if you need to convert that into a percentage, 29.27%. Okay? Um, likewise, we can calculate PB2 given A and so on. And then finally select the crypto type which has contributed for the largest proportion of returns. Okay? Alright, so that should explain everything. I will write down these answers just for you to compare your answers with my answers. PB2 given A equals 
3279 and we can also find TB3 given A that will be equal to I got 0 0.2810 And similarly, we will also find the remaining two. P B4 given A is equal to 0 0.0141. And we can also find P B5 given A, which is equal to, I got 0 0.0843 for that. Um, if you've got any slightly different answers, the reason may be uh, you're not putting all the required zeros before the decimal. For example, 1% is not 0.1, okay? When you enter it as a decimal, it should be entered as 0 0.01. 9% means 0 0.09. 8% means 0 0.08. On the other hand, 12% is just 0 0.12. So make sure that you entered your numbers correctly. And if you do so, you have to get these answers. Now. Which crypto type has contributed for the largest proportion of returns? Well, I just have picked the largest one. Um, I think this is the largest probability, 0.3279. That's from B2, which means Ethereum. So Ethereum has contributed for the largest proportion of return of Tim's portfolio. All right. So we discussed the conditional probability, the total probability rule, and the Bayes theorem. And also we discussed plenty of examples, and you are now in a completely good shape with all these highly sophisticated probability concepts. We are done. Thank you.